Arpeggios on a guitar has a special challenge to them, and we don't see that because, you know, very few people learn another instrument first and then they come to the guitar and, and wonder why it's so, it's such a mess basically on the fretboard. Because, and so we need to know this challenge because if we don't, we're just gonna be mystified and, and, and confused about why it seems so, such a, like such a messy task to really learn these arpeggio shapes across the neck. And we give up because we don't know the real challenge. So please listen. Uh, for the message in this video. Because if you look at a piano, every single octave on a piano is just repeated. It's exactly the same system, you know, four or five or six times, I don't know how many times, you know, on the piano. So you have from C to C, and every octave looks exactly the same. So you can play a melody down here, then go, go up a, a, a little bit, and then play the exact same melody one octave higher. You can do that to some extent on the guitar, but it's not as simple. You can do one arpeggio, just take every, if you wanna play a C major triad arpeggio, you just take every other note of the white keys from the C, and you have a perfect right triangle right there, or a perfect triad. And if you move your fingers exactly the same to the next, the D, you get a D minor, then an E minor. So, you know, it's a system, and it's really systematically laid out. But on a guitar, if you look at the fretboard and you want to play a C major arpeggio, it looks in 15, 20, 30 different ways. But on a piano, it's the same way all the time. You can in invert the, and put the root note on top and do different things or three different things, basically, with a three note chord. But that's it. On a guitar, because we have the same note in, 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 in multiple places on the neck here, Right? It, it's like it all it, it all becomes a mess <laughs> because the same the same um, C major triad or anything on the on the neck is different depending on where you play it. So if I want to learn all the um, major arpeggio shapes I, on a piano, that's really easy. But on a guitar, you have so many options as to where to play it and how it looks depending on where you play it on the neck. So what do we do about this? Well, the first thing I was um, introduced to when I was introduced to arpeggios, and this is still the same thing out there. So if you've been learning or trying to learn arpeggios, this is also your challenge. I learned the cage system when it came to scales. And that is basically taking all the notes of the major scale, lay them out on a fretboard, and then chop them up following a very simple rule that you want to play as vertical as possible. You want to assign one finger per fret, and then you want to play it up and down without moving your hand uh, back and forth. And you don't want to play two whole tones on one string. You don't want to have this interval. Um, hope you can see, or if you can't, choose the high resolution and zoom in here. Right? You got two whole tones on one string, two, one fret uh, or two frets in between each note. We want to avoid that, and we want to stay with our very compressed, very limited. So I can preferably, you know, move a little back and forth and don't do two whole tones. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just economy of movement, and we really like that in classical music because we want to execute as accurately as possible, and the less we have to move, the easier it is to execute each note and get a totally clean, perfectly executed note. Right? So that's a cool system. But then if we take that system, which is focused on economy of movement, because we get five shapes like this across the fretboard, five different cage shapes of any scale. The same thing goes for the pentatonic shapes, also five shapes that, that, that we have chopped the big shape, which is the entire fretboard, up into. But then we build on that system, which is focused on economy of movement. And we try to say, okay, then how do we learn arpeggios? Well, naturally, because we're focused on the cage shapes, we put those arpeggio shapes in there, right? You have five different um, major or minor scale shapes, and then you mark out, okay, you wanna play the C major arpeggio in the C major scale, right? You take the first cage shape, and then you just put, take a piece of paper, mark out the notes of that, of that C major arpeggio and play it in here. And what if I want to play the second step arpeggio, the D minor of the C major scale? 
right? You just play the same. <laughs> uh, I can't even do it because I'm not oriented in that way. It confuses my brain completely. But that was what I was trying to do. So I had five different cage shapes, right? Up on the neck. And then I tried to play within each one of these cage shapes. I tried to learn seven different arpeggio shapes. So it's five times seven shapes. Each shape has seven different arpeggios with a uniquely visual shape, right? And I have to learn that. And some people say, well, why don't you just learn the notes and then learn you know, on the fretboard and then learn what notes goes into? But it doesn't work like that. The brain is visual and the note can be a great help. That can be a system of itself that allows you to then play the shapes because you can say, okay, a C major triad or C major arpeggio consists of C, E, and G. And in this position, they would be laid out like this. Okay, but then the next step in the brain is that becomes a visual shape. You might see it inside of your head or on the fretboard, doesn't matter, but it becomes something visual because the visual is way faster then saying C, E, G, let me see, that's too slow when you're playing. So it becomes something visual anyway. And so what you end up with is five visual scale shapes. With, within each one of them, you have seven different, arpe visually different arpeggio shapes that you have to learn five times seven. That's 35 shapes in all, 35 arpeggio shapes. And we've just covered the, the arpeggios of the major scale, right? So that's an enormous amount of work. And I tried to do that, try, really tried to focus on that. But also what you, what you get into is that you have an uneven amount of notes on each string, right? In, in, this, in the case of C here, we got one on the first string, then two on the next, one on the next, one on the next, one on the next, one on the next, right? So, so the picking and the whole thing is messed up. And it's very hard to play it fast because there's no system to it. Right? So, whole point of this video, we need to break out, when it comes to arpeggios, you need to break out of the cage system, which is a good system for learning the shapes. I got another system called the fretboard freedom uh, system, and it's a totally different way of thinking um, that I consider superior, but the cage system is not bad. It's just a way of chopping up the big shape in, up into five different shapes so you can learn them and piece them together afterwards. But you need to leave that whole premise of thinking in vertical shapes because an arpeggio, the triad arpeggio, is where you want to put your focus. You want to say, how do I want to play these arpeggios? Don't think about scale shapes. Think about arpeggio shapes. And what would be the greatest way of playing them? And since there are, when we're talking about triads, we have three notes in any arpeggio, right? So the C major triad has C, E, and G in them. So if I can play that C major, let's just, you know, for one example here, let's just start on the root note in the third fret on the A string and say, if I can play that arpeggio from that C, then move to the next note on the A string, the E, and play the same C major arpeggio, I have a two different shapes now. Then I can move to the last note in the in the C yeah, um, major arpeggio here, and I can play the last shape. Then the next note on the A string will be the C again. So there are three notes in the C major arpeggio, and I have three shapes because I just start on each one of these notes. So it's only three shapes, and those three shapes is all major arpeggios. So instead of having to figure out a, a, a new shape within the cage shape, I focus on the arpeggio shape instead and say, let me lay out uh, uh, the arpeggios, focusing on the notes of the arpeggio. I hope this makes sense. It does in a second. So, but the second thing I want to focus on, you remember when we created the cage shapes, we focused on economy of movement and chopping up the big fretboard shape up into five different pieces so it was easier to learn. And we have different priorities when we create our system there, right? For our arpeggio system here, we want to focus on, you know, having as little to learn as possible and making it easier to play the arpeggio, right? So 
And since there are so, you know, much space in between the notes, we want to use sweep picking, but that we're going to talk about how to play arpeggios in another, in another video. So I'm going to create the arpeggio shape of having two notes on the first string, right? So we got a, the third and the seventh um, on the A string. And then I have one note on each of the other strings, and then I have two on the last, right? So two on the first, one in between, and then two on the last. And that allows me to, to have my pick sweep across the... That's so much easier than trying to go... Because you have an uneven amount of notes. And the cool thing is, when I then play my next arpeggio up here, I can use the same picking technique. It's the exact same thing. So I have less to learn. Right? Use the same picking technique, and the fingers almost does the same thing. They know that we have two notes on the top string and two notes in the bottom. We do the same thing from the E string. If we go... We just have six strings, then we have two notes on the bottom and two notes in the top. So I have very little to learn, and I have the same system, so I can play it really rapidly. If I want to, oh, speed isn't everything, Klaus. Well, who said it was everything? Uh, so why argue against somebody who doesn't exist? But speed is a good measure of your level of mastery. So if I can play it relatively fast, then playing it at a lower level of speed is really easy, right? It's super easy. But because we focus on the arpeggio here, I can really, I can do some great stuff now. I have a great deal of speed, efficiency when I execute the notes, and I only have three shapes to learn. Uh, in, in for the major and for the minor. Instead of five times seven different shapes within the cage shape, it's a nightmare, right? But then how do I mix the arpeggio with the scale? That's a totally different thing, right? How do I do that? Because, because before I had my cage shape and then I knew the arpeggio, so I could go... I could easily, like we talked about in the first video, I could easily focus on the chord, chord notes and then move to a scale note and then back to a chord note again. All right, that was C, G, D major. I could easily do that because I have my cage shape and then I have my arpeggio shape within there, right? But in this case, I, what I simply do is I take my C major shape and then I investigate, and that's a really good exercise because now I have to combine my cage shapes if that is the way I learned the scales. So I have to say, okay, what cage shape is down here? And what's the next cage shape? Okay, and here's my arpeggio. Where are the notes then of the scale? to invent around each and every chord note, I visualize the two K shapes and I integrate them by learning arpeggios. So now I'm just cross shapes suddenly. And, and, and that's such a great exercise. And that's actually one of the, the things that made me go more horizontally on the neck is working with arpeggios in this way. Right? So you focus on the arpeggio shapes instead and, and what you want to get out of your shape and how to lay out the notes and then you integrate it with the scale afterwards. That's the main point here. I hope this makes sense. Um, <laughs> and if it doesn't, please look into the little charts I created. Um, and I should say, uh, of course, that we have a new course out uh, about triads, about how to build arpeggios, and a lot of other things. Really, the the whole uh, the whole uh, intense immersion of how to master arpeggios on the highest level. And it's a very dense course with a lot of information on very little time, but it's very uh, logically laid out. So I hope you go check that out. But for now, look into the charts here and then start really focusing on learning these arpeggio shapes and looking at how can I use them to create melodies with a focus on the first lesson of this series. 
right? Maybe take a looper pedal, play the C major scale, have a C major running in the background, and then the C major arpeggio. Right? And then start creating little melodies and just experiment with it. Um, and I should say that, you know, limit yourself to a little area of the fretboard, just three strings in one position, mark out the C major arpeggio, and then start playing around with it so you get that experience of how this works and how easy it is suddenly to create melodies that sound totally together. And don't worry about the fact that we have, you know, a, a whole system to learn here. Uh, uh, you know, seven different arpeggios, not arpeggio shapes anymore because we handle those. We only have minor shapes, three minor shapes and three major shapes uh, in a five and six string version. But but it's, it's but we have to learn to combine the scale and the arpeggios, but we'll talk more about that. So um, start, start uh, practicing this and start experiencing it so you get it in your body and really get that excitement about how easy it is to create melodies and cool lines on the spot when you have your tools in order, when you know your craft. Mm -hmm.